tonight on Countdown to Green. We take a look back at all the action from Las Vegas. We prepare you for everything for tonight's race at Atlanta. And we take a look at how you're racing at home with the Logitech Show Us Your Rig segment. All that and more tonight on Countdown to Green. Presented by eNASCAR as we will get you revved up for the third race of this 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series campaign. About 30 minutes away from the green flag and happy that you're with us on this Tuesday night as always. My name is Evan Pasoka with Blake McCandless and Alan Kavana. And gentlemen, uh, thanks for the invite for popping in a little bit early this week. Camille out this time around. So the production team figured just swap one Canadian with another, I guess. But we're excited. It's going to be a fun race coming up and uh, it'll all get kicked off as we continue to crown our champion and continue on this campaign but vegas a couple of weeks ago my hometown track blake we had a lot of fun bantering about that up in the booth but uh tonight a different challenge even though from maybe afar those racetracks look very similar compared to tonight well again kind of going backwards in time you think about the cup series schedule and what a memorable finish probably one of the more memorable finishes in recent memory that we saw in the nascar cup series at atlanta motor speedway alan i think we would be set up to see just about the same thing tonight as well I would hope so. Those Sunday drivers put on a show. They set the standard. Now it's time for the Coke Series drivers to do their part. Two weeks in a row. Think about that. Or at least two races in a row. What we saw out in Las Vegas. I hope we get a, well, I don't think the drivers do, but I hope we get some of that same drama toward the end of this race tonight at Atlanta. You've heard of sim to reality, hopefully a little bit of reality to sim. If we can just get an inkling of how exciting that Atlanta finish was, tonight's going to be a show. We'll also be joined a little bit later on on the show by the most recent NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series winner, Raja Karuth. But before we get to all of that and more, Blake, let's take a look back at two weeks ago from Vegas. And again, a lot to talk about at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. 100 laps on the docket. And Alan, you know, going throughout this race, we saw a lot of changes. We saw long green flag runs, but we saw, I think, a glimpse of the contenders that will be a factor not only tonight, but throughout the rest of the season with our first true test at a mile and a half. And we saw some early cautions, which were not good. I mean, some early incidents. Look, for the most part, I give the field a lot of credit. I mean, this race at Las Vegas, you could see three wide, sometimes four wide, long stretches of clean green flag racing. But when there were incidents, it was so detrimental to some of these drivers, especially early on, trying to stay and keep their position here in the points. You can see the 99 here for Zwack is about to go around, unfortunately. Other title contenders went around much earlier, but this race turned into not only good racing, strategy racing, different drivers on different strategies, and then one heck of an ending, Blake. I think Caden Honeycutt showing right there that these drivers had pretty much fair, free use of the racetrack in front of them. Derek Bordeaux went around a little bit later on, but Alan, we were talking about it, that we had a memorable finish at Atlanta in the NASCAR Cup Series, and we were treated to one here at Las Vegas Motor Speedway as well. We mentioned the strategy. You can see Malik Ray and Ryan Luza that had to come down pit road through the long green flag cycle that we had multiple strategies involved. Some drivers stayed out, some drivers pit, but at the end, Nick Ottinger, Cody Bias coming down to the end, and it is Keegan Ooh. Leahy who escapes with the win to lock himself potentially into the playoffs. What a moment. What a moment for him just to reestablish himself, right? The former champion, Keegan Leahy. But, you know, thinking the playoffs and thinking championship, I I'm thinking about that early incident that took out both Garrett Lowe and Tucker Mentor. They are in such a hole early on in the season. And Blake, I'll say it, look, it's never too early to worry, especially in a series like this where the checkered flags mean so much to put yourself in a points hole. I'm worried about them going forward. These are two drivers that were championship contenders last year to be in such a hole early on this season. I'm worried for him, Blake. 
Well, I'm worried for them, too. And you think with Atlanta looming, that is a daunting task to try and climb out of that points hole this early in the season. It's going to be an uphill battle for sure. But my biggest thought coming away from this race is what more could you want? I know Evan and I had an incredible time up there trying to dissect everything that was going on, the multiple strategies that we had. And when talking to these drivers, they say all the time, we want these races to play out. We've gone to overtime many times over the last couple of years. We want these races to play out. We want strategy. We want the fastest cars to be able to perform. That's exactly what they got. It just so happened that it also put on a spectacular show for us and the eNASCAR Coca Cola iRacing Series fans out there. So we got everything I think you could want in a Coke Series race at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And after that, we'll go ahead and take a look at the playoff standings. Now, of course, Leahy with his win at Las Vegas Motor Speedway goes right to the top as he's in the top 20 in points, joining Wyatt Tinsley after his Daytona win. But Alan, the one thing I am looking at, look at the top five in points. Keegan Leahy, former champion. Casey Kerwin, former series champion. Steven Wilson, defending champion. Our past champions mm. are performing so very well early on in this season. And then let's not forget about the segment points, Blake. That's new this year. It is. These segment points now, again, of course, you can see that Wyatt Tinsley drops down to six. This is a separate point system that will be happening as we split up this season into segments. There is $3,000 on the line for the driver that wins segment one, segment two, segment three, as well as five crucial playoff points. So Keegan Leahy not only gets the playoff points from a win, but he has more to try to fight for over the course of these next couple of races as well. Cold hard cash. What, what a great motivator that is. This, let's look at the team standing. Spire Motorsports on top right there. Tony Kanon Esports, though, made a big jump in the last race, plus four. You look at some of the other ones, though. Joe Gibbs Racing, you can see minus six after that race. And then on the other side of the column, some good and bad. Kevin Harvick Incorporated, the newbies around town, right? Plus seven after that last race. And then Front Row Motorsports. We saw what happened with Bordeaux and, and Michael Cozy Jr. Uh, what With them, minus seven. Look, a lot of pride, trophy, some money on the line in the team standings as well. You don't want to neglect those standings, especially when you're trying to come up through the ranks. And unfortunately, toward the bottom, one of our newer teams, BS Competition, sitting there in 19th out of 20. And part of the reason is because their drivers, they keep getting involved in incidents sometimes with each other. But let's get the skinny on that because we asked the CEO of BS Competition to be here with us. And he joined us earlier today. Florian Hosper joined us. And for a team that really is known for the non-ovals of uh, iRacing, we asked him what made him come over to eNASCAR. Yeah, we've we've always looked at eNASCAR uh, as yeah one of the top eSports series out there on our, I would say, favorite platform, iRacing. And uh, uh, yeah, there, there are not so many top level series, but we also knew that, yeah, we were not a natural, let's say, team to to do NASCAR. Yeah, and so we had to, uh, we we never really, yeah, tried to get into it and so on, because we thought it's so far away. But then, uh, yeah, uh, the conversation started and uh, and it uh, was suddenly possible that we that we get a spot and that we have a chance to compete and uh, yeah we just we just grabbed it yeah because it was a uh, was such a great op opportunity and uh, to be honest now uh, with the first races already done uh, yeah this just confirms uh, our our view of the series it's just awesome to be a part of it and to to get this chance because uh, yeah i racing is handling it so well uh, nesca is so much behind it so uh, it's a it's a great pleasure and honor to be a part of this and they're getting an early uh, feel of just how tough the competition is because they have two drivers, two great drivers, Jordi Lopez, Garrett Lowe. We asked Florian how he came to get those two drivers on his team. Yeah, I mean, in our DNA um, is is the is the competitive spirit, I would say. Yeah. So if we want to, or if we compete in anything, we want to uh, get front runners in, and we want to be yeah competitive. And uh, so we looked at. Uh, the pool of drivers that there was, and uh, at last year's results, and uh, and also uh, at who could fit fit the team and, uh, uh, and and fit to the sponsors that we have on board, and so on. Uh, yeah, and then we reached out to to Jordi and Garrett, and uh, and it all worked out fine. And uh, yeah, I'm just so happy that they are part of the team now for for this campaign. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, also here it was confirmed they. 
they slotted in really nicely. They are, they they understand our yeah spirit yeah because we don't take ourselves too serious yeah so we uh, want to enjoy what we are doing but still be competitive and uh, and I think both of them from different angles I would say they are different characters for sure but uh, but they yeah perfectly fit into our BS uh, BS competition family different characters a lot of talent though together got to dig out of that hole now there's no no telling obviously the international appeal of iRacing but we asked Florian about the growth of NASCAR in Germany and what he's seen yeah I think uh, I think it's growing growing a lot uh, uh, basically as all US based sports I would say it's also a huge growth of NFL and NBA and in Germany in particular and then there's this this funny aspect because uh, in the old days I've been working with a guy called Pete Fink uh, uh, as, a, as a motor racing editor as a as an author a writer and news news editor and um, yeah this guy uh, had a huge interest in NASCAR 20 years ago uh, when it was still very small here in Germany or not or the audience was was uh, limited I would say, but he he wrote about it and then he started commentating in uh, on, on on television and now we are working with Pete, uh, let's say for our team streams of Inesca and he's this he's this link really to to the German NASCAR community and it's growing and he's been writing books about it so he's Mr. NASCAR in Germany and so it's so cool for us to have him involved in Inesca and he's learning so many things and. First, it was a bit skeptical, maybe, and said, "Okay, I haven't, I, I didn't know that." And suddenly, there was a strategy thing, a fuel-saving thing in Las Vegas, and he was overwhelmed. And he said, "Well, this is the real deal, and like the real deal." So I think there is a really good uh, perspective for uh, us getting connected to the to the German NASCAR side and telling them about eNASCAR. I love that, seeing the NASCAR brand grow and people love it across the pond, but that goes both ways. And we know how much BS competition is done in sim racing. So we asked him, eNASCAR now, what else are you gonna do to expand in the world of sim racing? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's all about trying new things every time and to uh, yeah broaden your scope of uh, activity. I mean, we we have teams out there in the in the sim racing world that are yeah focusing on certain platforms and then they're focusing on certain type of events and so on. But we've always said we want to be as widespread or as open to to everything as possible. And uh, now expanding into into UNESCO is showing exactly this. So we want to compete there as well. We want to be strong there. We want to uh, extend our story line that we tell all the time with the zebras and the and the yeah bit of uh, ironical and uh, and entertaining uh, side of things. And uh, and what I what really surprised me is how how um, far developed this aspect already is in Inesca with all the organizations being at work and there are so many so many different approaches of of uh, marketing and communicating uh, or com communicating the series uh, and it's so playful and it's also so serious so it's a, it's a really tough environment and cool environment on so many um, different levels and this is what I what I really enjoy so uh, it's a great next step for us as a team and it's great to hear new teams, new perspectives, especially teams that are big in sim racing, but also now choosing to be in NASCAR. We, we see the growth everywhere. We really do, and I think it applies not only, Blake, to the drivers. We talk about new drivers in every season, but the mix of pro sim teams and the NASCAR teams on the team side of things for that championship, I think it was equally as fun to track every year. Oh, for sure. And we have a lot of brand new teams this year, so they're getting acclimated. We heard her right there about just kind of the nuances and learning kind of what's unique, not only about the NASCAR space, but sim racing in general. And it's great to educate them and see them try to get up to speed and compete in the series because that's what they're here to do. They're here to win. Well, as we continue celebrating the 15th season of this eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series, let's take a look back in time once more and head to the vault with iRacing Zone, Justin Melillo. Every dynasty starts somewhere. Ray Alfala didn't just wake up one day as a four-time eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series champion. He raced his way to the front, and he made it happen. Four times first title came back in 2011 at the Homestead Miami Speedway. 
That day, Alfala finished a cool second place to John Gorlinski, holding off Thomas Lewandowski and current NASCAR Cup Series rookie Josh Berry. Ray said he wanted to go out on top, despite already having the title secured going into Miami. Besides, he already had three wins on the season. He won at Daytona, Richmond, and Texas. Every driver in the series knew if Ray Alfala had pace, he never wasted it, and he never let off for a single moment. But that's why he's four-time, and the only driver in series history with multiple titles. And that's been a look back at one of the most memorable moments of the last 14 seasons of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. Here, do you want Alan to just take it? And of course, that inaugural championship for Ray Alfalo would snowball into so much more, now holding four eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series titles, and of course, back in the series this year as he hunts for magic number five. But looking at all those names, Blake, John Gorlinski, Thomas Hazard, some of the who's who in series history. Well, again, I love seeing these old highlights, the car of tomorrow, which, uh, heck, I was running in Draftmasters last night. Uh, it's great great to see this car back and just how far this series has come. It's nice to, to see that we still have a lot of these replays surviving from, what, almost about 15 years ago? Uh, I think that's pretty incredible, but also to see kind of the longevity of some of the stars that we've had in this series over the course of the last 15 years or so. Yeah, preserving that history, the replays, the results, I think is so important. And again, we'll continue showing these all year long here on Countdown to Green as we go through the vault. Well, I mentioned off at the top of the show, I wasn't the only special addition to the panel here. And we'll get to our much more exciting guest. He is a NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series winner. Raja Karuth is joining Countdown to Green and Alan is with him. Yeah, so happy to have him live here on the show from his sim seat. We'll talk all about that. But Raja, since victory lane up until this moment, what's it been like to call yourself a winner? Do you ever get some Olive Garden? Do you get to celebrate? I don't know who you're, Raja. I did not unmute my mic. Hello. Oh, there, there, there you go. Hey, cool. you, you can win a truck race. You just got to unmute your mic on here. <laughs> yeah, man. No, it's uh, it's been crazy. I guess it's been, what, 12, 12 days, almost two weeks. Um, it, it, good, to, good to be here with you guys, but I've just been ready to get back to the racetrack. I honestly got kind of annoyed with that stuff like a couple of days into it just because obviously like it, it's, it's a great moment, right? Um, and I tried my best to savor it and enjoy it, but we still got a whole season left. So I'm excited to, get to continue uh, to, to build our strength. Eyes on the prize. That's what a lot of people appreciate about you and in, in the competitor inside you. There was so much praise when you took that checkered flag, uh, you know, in, in real life IRL, but also the online community. They see you as one of their own. What does it mean like to you to have that support from the online sim community? Yeah, it definitely means a lot. I mean, I've been on iRacing almost six years now, and um, it's the, the one of the sole reasons why I was able to even get my foot in the door to race in real life. I remember doing the Ignite Series in 2018, and um, and really just, I didn't get to race a lot of like V6, the old tire model, right? And, and the COT, like you guys mentioned, but uh, kind of being on for uh, when everything went up during COVID and uh, kind of through how this, the, the world of iRacing has grown in the last handful of years has been really special. Like it or not, people will point to you now as the example, as someone who made it from sim racing to the highest levels of NASCAR and the one you showed them a path. Do you like that responsibility? People will look up to you now and say, he did it, maybe I can too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've said it before, like it's, it's nothing special about me. Like there's plenty of people that have been better than me, faster than me on, on, on the sim for, for years. Um, but uh, I think I just, I, I put in the time, I, I did the little things, right, from making laps on here to going to the racetrack and getting my name out there, working on my socials, just trying to do all the little things that I felt like helped, um, and maybe not everything helped, um, but I, I just tried to do my best. Um, so I, I definitely hope that, that more people can, you know, not just be drivers, right, because there's only 40 drivers in Cup, and, and you know 40 and, and xfinity and trucks so on and so on that's very small amount of people compared to 
you know the lot of other jobs you can get in racing whether it be in, on the engineering side the the television and broadcast side um you know pr and legal stuff so there there's a, a lot of different opportunities i think for folks to get into driving uh and not just on the nascar side so i think it's good that uh that i can just represent that you know we know you love this series. You've got that vintage championship shirt on. You're about to race here in a second. Do your own stuff tonight. But Bristol, let's talk about tonight uh, or the, this weekend in the truck. How is Sim helping you? How are you preparing for Bristol? Yeah, so I mean, we, we had Sim, um, you know, yesterday and I did some today too. Just uh, kind of going similar to how I went last year at GMS and um, working on some things just to be a little bit better. So. I'm excited. Bristol's been a racetrack I've, I've loved, and honestly, Bristol, and it's hard, right? Because in real life, the tracks change annually with different compounds they put on the racetrack, uh, weather, uh, how that affects the perforations, the complexion of the track. But Bristol is one of the, the tracks on the service that I feel like is decently close to how it feels in real life, uh, for the most part. So. Um, I definitely like to, to drive on there just to refresh before I go to the racetrack, but I'm pretty excited because the the, the drive up to Bristol is a lot of fun. Um, just driving up through the mountains and uh, that's that's the opening track from cars, so it's, it doesn't get any any better. <laughs> Raja Karuth, enjoy that first victory. We're all looking forward to the next one. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, for sure. We'll have him stick around a little bit too when we get set to drop the green flag in a little bit, but uh, appreciate that uh, t-shirt he had from that 2022 eNASCAR finale at the NASCAR Hall of Fame. We'll keep things going along now with everybody's favorite segment here on Countdown to Green as we look at your rigs at home, presented by our friends at Logitech G. This week, all from Facebook, starting with Brad Nelson, brand new to iRacing. Welcome. Yeah, Brad's got a very nice setup here. That looks like a very comfortable chair. That's that's Ooh. a place where you could sit there and spend a little bit of time, run a couple C fix if you wanted to. So, Brad, simple, uh, like the monitor setup and everything, eye level. And, uh, Alan, I'd say that simple sometimes works. Nothing wrong with comfort. Let's talk about simple and different when we look at this next one coming up. This will be a first for us when they switch. This is for Matt Hummel. This is a mobile setup that Matt actually has in the sleeper cab portion of his semi truck. He's going yeah. across the country. He's doing his job, making a living, but he's also sim racing. So no excuses to any of you out there because if Matt can get it done, we appreciate you, man. Thank you for joining us. I've heard a lot of great stories about about a lot of folks who are starting to kind of use that as a, as a sim setup, but we got another unique one here. Well, we've seen a lot of very unique chairs in, in these few. This one's from Mike and you know, I got to say, corner of the L desk is definitely something to try and pull off, but I think he did it quite nicely. I like that color, Ferrari vibes. And here we got another simple setup from Stephen Fry. This is all you need to go race, and I love that steering wheel, kind of Formula One-esque there, but nice, uh, simple desk setup, good cable management. Look, good, good lighting there. Go fast with that. I like it. I also like where it's sitting on the desk sometimes. It makes it <laughs> pretty stable right there. We see it. This MPI wheel right here, again, another very nice setup uh, for this driver. Tim, we appreciate you sending in your rig. Even got the old school pedals that are still chugging along there. We appreciate everybody submitting theirs. And remember, you can use the hashtag eNASCAR and tag us on all social media platforms. And maybe we'll talk about your rigs coming up in a few weeks. Now, I'm a big stat guy. I love diving into the numbers. but. This is your forte here on Countdown to Green Island. So walk us through some of the Atlanta trends we'll be keeping an eye on tonight. Yeah, well, this one's different because remember, Atlanta changed with its surface. So let's look at some of the trends. This is the 12th E NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series race we've had at Atlanta, but just the second race on this new layout and banking. We only have kind of that one data point. So that's why it should be fun, sort of unexpected tonight, because we don't know that much about the surface and what it does and what to expect. Now, last year's race, did give us 20 lead changes between 14 different drivers. We know it has that drafting aspect, that pack aspect. I hope for more of that tonight, 20 lead changes. That's a great number right there. 30 of the 39 cars finished on the lead lap. That interval from first to 30th place, just 2.8 seconds. What does that tell you? We were talking earlier about digging yourself a hole. If 30 of the 39 cars are on the lead lap and you have an issue, say even on the final lap, 
Ooh, it's gonna be a tough points night for anybody out there. So you gotta keep it clean, but also stay there and be aggressive. Five cautions were thrown during the 2023 race. They did have to utilize two attempts at E-NASCAR overtime. The big one always looming at the Daytonas and Talladegas of the world, certainly Atlanta as well. Now with this layout, you don't wanna be a part of that. Steven Wilson won the 2023 race after starting 14th, and he went on to win, of course, the E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series Championship. He was good last time out in Vegas, where we were, didn't quite get the win. Got a new car, new colors this time around. Same talent, so I would expect him to be a hot pick tonight when we get to our pick segment, guys. Good race, though. It's a fun one. Like I said, if we get any little bit of what we saw in the real world not that long ago, or even what we had on the sim here last time out, it is going to be a good time. Well, just as we get set to wrap things up, I think it's time to make our predictions. And you three always have a lot of fun bantering about, well, who's making good picks and who isn't. I will kind of play Switzerland in this one, and I'll deliver Camille's pick last. So, Blake, you're on the hot seat up first. All right. Well, you know, we talked about some drivers that have been struggling coming into the season, and I decided to go with the driver that is dead last. In two races, he has scored two points, but I think he's going to find a way to come out on top tonight. I'm going to go with Jordy Lopez taking it home tonight at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Again, a driver that we have seen run so well, as well as his Technical Alliance teammates on these type of tracks. So I think Jordy struggled to start the year, but I think he gets off on the right foot tonight. Jordy Lopez, second career win. That's what I'm I saying. Love, I love the pick. I love the paint scheme, especially tonight. But look, I am in the basement. I'm not happy about that. So I'm going to go with what I know. Who was great at the drafting racing? Who was great at the pack racing? Our boy, Wyatt Tinsley, did everything he could. Got every checkered flag in Daytona. Hopefully this is something similar because, man, do I need some points. So, Wyatt, do a solid for me, buddy. You were talking about zone defense. That's a, a full court <laughs> press move, right, to make up some points? <laughs> Got to do it. Got to shoot from the logo. Well, it's a long way to go still this year. And on behalf of Camille, well, she's going with somebody who has had success not only last year, but this year. It is the defending Shocker. series Ooh. champion, Steven wow. Wilson. He was the pole sitter last week at Las Vegas. He led the most laps. I know it's not the same kind of racetrack, but you talk about playing from a position of strength. I don't think you can blame her for that pick. That's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, often, often, Stephen Wilson and Camille go hand in hand. Uh, this year, it's actually paying off for her, Blake. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and again, uh, I'm, I'm really, it, I really thought you were going to say Casey Kerwin, Alan. I, <laughs> when you said Wyatt, Tim, I was so ready. You teed it up, and I'm like, he's definitely picking Casey. He went with Wyatt, who, by the way, what the last time I picked him, he won. So I wish you uh, not the same amount of luck. I know. I hope so. I need it. I need it. We got a long way to go this year, guys. I appreciate you letting me hang out and spend some time with you on a countdown to Green Island. Appreciate you as always. On the other side, Blake and I will be here with you from green to checker. But until then, thanks for joining us for Countdown to Green, presented by eNASCAR. We're going green flag racing from Atlanta next. Every time you sit behind the wheel, you buckle up for the unexpected. You get ready to take on the competition, embrace yourself for the chaos, the speed, the weather, the unknown. But above all, when strapping in, you put trust in yourself, your intuition, making your guide to win, your drive to win, He's a winner in this. and nothing is going to stop you from winning.
when you want to be the best, you can't settle for the rest. For anything on iRacing, there's just one name you need, Mo Cody. We now provide the best of the best in setups, paint schemes, coaching, broadcasting, and event organization. With cars across all four license classes, we have what you need to hit the track with confidence. Grab a subscription and save money while going fast at MaconeSetupShop.com forward slash subscriptions. And remember, at Maconey Setup Shop, there are setups, but your victories. What does fearless look like? Like sliding through a glimmer of daylight? Side by side for the top spot. Like trading paint with a champion. Like starting in the back of the pack and stopping at nothing till everyone is choking on your dust. What does fearless look like? Find out for yourself. The NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. Something that I can't explain The wind is calling now with my name Let it rain on me You know I put in the hours And I'm not gonna wait in line I'm gonna take what's mine See. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You gotta take the lead to $500,000 heads to NASCAR's newest super speedway. We're tonight from iRacing's virtual Atlanta Motor Speedway. We say good evening, sim racing fans, and welcome to round three of the 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. And as always, happy that you're spending your Tuesday night with us here on the iRacing Esports Network. Alongside Blake McCandless, my name is Evan Pasoko. Blake, in a second trip out to the new Atlanta Motor Speedway, has got a tall task at hand if it's going to top what we saw in Las Vegas two weeks ago. It does, but Evan, I think we're going to match that, and I think we're going to go a little bit beyond it. Not only is this a track that iRacing built, not only did we see incredible, an incredible show in the NASCAR Cup Series here a couple of weeks ago, but even running personally here at Atlanta Motor Speedway and NIS, with a lot of these same drivers that are in this field tonight, absolute chaos. The moves that we're going to see tonight are going to be mind-blowing. These drivers are going to display a ton of skill, and at the end of it all, I think we're going to be set up for an absolutely wild finish. And we're happy, as always, that you're strapped into the virtual seat and along for the ride with us. Let's go trackside and take a look at your Coca-Cola starting grid here from Atlanta. Pole position to the M8080 of Ryan Luza. He'll bring us to the green flag. And the highest starting rookie in the field starts P2. It is Travis Pastrana's Nitro Circus Sim Racing Team in 99 car of Matthew Zawack. Row number two, we'll see the second Nitro Circus car. A Dylan Duvall roll from the inside into P3 in his 41 car. And Wyatt Tinsley going to be the outside. He starts tonight in P4. Parker White in the Williams Esports 53 will start alongside the William Byron Esports 97 to Tucker Minter. They will start P5 and 6. Back on row number four, it is the BS competition of Ronnie and Jordy Lopez. Next to the Joe Gibbs Racing 54 of Daniel Falkingham. And to round out your top 10, inside row five, the second BS competition Ford. That one, the 89 car, Garrett Lowe. He's next to the RFK Racing number six of Timmy Holmes. 
It'll be Tim Dillon Esports' own Taylor Hurst that'll go from the inside of row six with fourth time Ray Alfala for E-Racer going from the 12th position tonight. Starting 13th will be Seth the Merchant for FTR Excel with Donovan Strauss, the second Williams Esports driver going from 14th. Starting 15th tonight for Spire Motorsports is Casey Kerwin, Kwame Scott, Latar Esports looking to make up some ground in the team standings. Kwame Scott will start from 16th. 17th is Zach Novak for Oxygen Esports with Tyler Gary rounding out the outside of row nine in the 18th spot. And then a row of Michaels here in row 10. It'll be Cozy Jr. on the inside for front row. And 2311's Michael Guess will go from 20th. That'll bring us halfway home to row number 11. Uber is the Kevin Harvick Inc. number 29 of Jimmy Mullis and the Pittsburgh Knights 55 of Ryan Doucette. Back on row number 12, Garrett Maines will take the number 12 car for FGR XL E-Racing off the grid from 23rd. He's next to Cody Bias, who's right behind his Pittsburgh Knights teammate. He's on the outside in 24th. Colin Keister in the Tony Kadan Esports 66 car starts to the inside of row 13. And Steven Wilson's got some work to do to catch his M80 teammate on pole. His 10 car starts in 26th. Nick Ottinger, the William Byron Esports number 25, starts next to the Latart Esports 40 of of Dylan Alt, they'll be 27th and 28th. And through your top 30, the second TK entry, it's the Tony Kadani Sports number 11 of Vicente Salas next to the team Dylan Esports number three of Jonathan Delaney. For a second consecutive week, it's going to be a march through the field for Briar LaPrade for Junior Motorsports, starting from 31st. Derek Bordeaux saw him get turned in our highlight reel from Las Vegas. He'll go from 32nd. Malik Ray starts 33rd tonight for Spire Motorsports. Matt Busa, representing KHI, starts in 34th. Graham Boland starts 35th tonight, the number 48 for the Kansas City Pioneers. And last week's winner, Keegan Leahy, will have some ground to make up starting in 36th tonight. 37th to Bobby Zielinski for JGR, another front runner from Vegas a week ago, along with Femi Olat in 38th in row 19. And around out the rear here in row number 20, Caden Honeycutt for Junior Motorsports and Colin Bowden for RFK Racing. Going to have some ground to make up here over the course of 100 laps in Atlanta tonight. It's a look top to bottom of your Coca-Cola starting grin. Tonight's pole sitter gets his first pole of 2024. Let's chat with the 2017 Series champion, Ryan Luzes, starting from P1, Blake. Well, Ryan, you won pole position tonight. I imagine that's got to be a good feeling, but with everything that goes on here at Atlanta Motor Speedway, are you at ease at all being able to start up here at the front of the field? Not at all. Um, I kind of just wanted to ride around in the back. But I figured, you know, I had to put a lot down and uh, we ended up here. So um, we'll kind of see, maybe I can see up here, but I'll probably just go, you know, once I, once I lose a couple of laps um, or once I lose a couple of spots, I'll probably just drop back and ride because I'm expecting this to be uh, not too pretty, but we'll see. All right, so Ryan Luza from the pole, Evan, is looking to try and play things a little bit safe tonight. May stick around up front for a little bit, but he thinks this race is going to get pretty chaotic go to the back of the middle portion of the race and we wish him the best of luck and by the way Evan grab that pole in a dead tie for the front of the field I don't think I've ever seen this in an NASCAR race the top two times down to a thousandth of a second tied and then third fourth and fifth all ran a 31 104 so a three-way tie for the third position it was close to try and win the top spot tonight on the starting grid Hey, that's your top five separated by four one thousandths of a second. It is the second super speedway race, Blake, in three weeks to open the season. Let's look at our NASCAR race analysis. Pretty straightforward. 100 laps will make for 154 miles here at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. One of the more difficult pit roads to get on, Evan. Again, this isn't like real life where we're pitting on the back straightaway. We are pitting out of turn four here at Atlanta Motor Speedway tonight, so very difficult with all the speed on this banking to get down to 45 miles an hour, and we'll see drivers be able to go a little bit past the halfway mark in terms of fuel mileage if they so choose uh, to try and stay out and get their track position first fixed setup race of the season. We'll dive more into that over the course of the night, but as always happy that you're tuning in with us on a Tuesday night. Pace car down and in field in the hands of the number 80 Ford of Ryan Luza. Barney stands ready. Green flag in the air. Let's go racing at Atlanta.
Not a lot of space to play with. Outside line with the draft to the race lead early goes Matthew Zawack. Zawack's going to be able to take it. He has a little bit of help behind him from Wyatt Tinsley, your Daytona winner. Remember, he swept everything at Daytona. He won the clash. He won his heat in the clash, and he ended up winning at Daytona. So we know that Wyatt Tinsley, a young gun in this series, knows a thing or two about the draft. But Evan, the one thing I want to watch early on here in these opening couple of laps is how much separation that you'll see between these two lines. Do we see a third line forming? And just like what happened at Daytona, Casey Kerwin went to the middle almost immediately at the start of the race. We see him trying to form up a little bit of momentum there, trying to push Seth the Merchant through the middle for about 10th or 12th on back or so. But they're already making some progress. Wasting no time, right as you mentioned, the third lane. We got a look of it back at about 14th spot. It simmers down, leaving only Guest there. He's the lone black and white car, about 20th now. As without the drafting support, he drops like a rock. Leaders go back to two by two. But for how long? There's the onboard perspective with him. They keep passing him inside and out. He started this race in 20th, but has slipped back down about an extra five or six spots. Finally gets an opening, tucks in line on the bottom, and you can see everybody else two by two for the moment. Blake, they were plenty three and four wide, though, in the practice session that preceded qualifying. We know they can do it. The question is, how early do we see it? Uh, it's really tough to tell. We heard Ryan lose. A, I would think, you know, he had a pretty straightforward strategy and that he was the pole sitter. He needs to just stay up front and try to keep his track position as long as possible. So I think the one thing tonight is there's really no wrong way you can go. You can guess right. Things can work to your favor, but it's really just hard to hard to know exactly what type of strategy these drivers are going to be willing to employ as one car that that's the six that is just up by the outside wall and almost scraped to getting into turn one timothy holmes and i think he senses a little bit of what brian Luza was talking about a little bit earlier that if uh, if you think something's going to happen you definitely don't want to be uh, right in the catalyst for where it happens because uh, it could end your night pretty quickly he tried to bail through the kinks on the quad oval. It was a bit of a tricky spot. Checked up the outside line, going off and into turn one. And look at that big swing down to the inside for Parker White, trying to get underneath the number 90 of Jory Lopez. Five laps down at Atlanta, five different race leaders already. White leads the bottom. It's the 90, the 89, I should say. Garrett Lowe leading the top side, pushed by the 90 of Jordy Lopez. No separation throughout the field. Field. Looks like they're thinking about three wide a couple of rows back. The leaders all over each other that time by the stripe as White going to be the first driver to lead two laps. You know, I got to say Parker White has just been so impressive to start this season. Knew he had a lot of talent. He was going to be somebody that was going to have staying power in this series for a while. But through the opening couple of races, I think, you know, it, sometimes it takes a while to get your sea legs here in the C-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series, and White was certainly a factor, hung around in the top 20 all last season. That's why he was easily able to earn his way back. But I think we've seen a different part for White this year, that not only is he going to be a factor and be able to be competitive, staying in the top 20, avoiding relegation at the end of the season, he's going to be up front. He's going to be competing for wins. And by the way, when we get to some road course racing, I think he's going to have something to say about that as well. He nearly won on the streets of Chicago last year. As you continue watching all of this action, we mentioned it on Countdown the Green that we would bring him over to the show. And Raja Karuth is hanging out with us on the broadcast. I'll introduce him as he shouted it out in Countdown to Green. Uh, 2018 ENASCAR Ignite Series alum. Raja Karuth, a bit of a deep cut there. But Raj, some recent success, a race winner in the NASCAR Truck Series. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, I mean, it's cool to cool to watch from this perspective. I, I've gotten the good chance to race against a lot of these guys over the years on the sims, so cool to watch them compete at the highest level. We see this sim used for so many different things, right? You use it as a training tool and, and are actively doing prep for your next uh, truck series start in it. Then you got the guys like this who compete and practice to be at the top level within this eSports championship. Just tell us a little bit about your experience with some of the names in here and the kind of time it takes to put in the success to be at this level. Yeah, I, that's a really good point. I think about guys like, like Kwame Scott, Dominic Strauss, that started after I did and, and really grind, grinded and, and made a lot of uh, uh, sacrifices to use their time and uh, just raced on here. Um, so to, it's cool to see these guys kind of grow and uh, and mature and some of them not so much and uh, just like I said compete at the highest level because you know you can race against these guys and, and random fix races right and, and see how good they are and that's 
one thing I think that's really cool about the sim. So it's been interesting to watch how this race has unfolded so far. Um, I know you, you had mentioned there had been a new, new leader almost every lap, so it's definitely cool to see. Super competitive and no shock there based on what we saw out of this race here on the surface uh, back in 23. Uh, these cars are in a fixed setup race here tonight. iRace, it is obviously already such an equal platform, right? Uh, the cars are so similar. Those setups are kind of the only chance some of these teams get to build a little bit of separation. But even then, they're so close on a weekly basis. Tonight, fixed setups. They've all got the exact same thing. Is that challenging or hampering at all to a driver? Or at a racetrack like this, is it so close enough that, you know, those little tweaks on the setup side wouldn't be able to get you away from everybody else regardless? Yeah. Yeah, I think for, for a place like Atlanta, right, it it doesn't change much because you're going to be really packed up, especially with, with this current scan, this current version of Atlanta. It's, it's really fresh and the grip's still really high. Uh, but, you know, my, my, my buddy and Bleak, oh, they're crashing. There they go. Spin it on the back, and it's a big wad of about a half a dozen cars. You saw it first, halfway down the back stretch. Alfala, it more evolved. Raj, we appreciate you sticking around. I know you've got some racing to do, so we'll let you jump out of here. But best of luck, and hopefully we'll chat again soon. Oh, hopefully those guys didn't turn up, get torn up too bad. We'll take a second look and see just what the damage report is as Ray Alfala, I think, was in the danger zone first off of turn number two. Blake, we'll wait to see it, to call it, but it looks like it started in and around some three watt as they were coming off of turn two. You know, I got to say, Roger may have a future in broadcasting. He caught that as soon as it was happening. I was about to jump in and kind of interrupt the interview for a second there, but he basically caught it uh, as soon as I saw it. And it was, I believe, Ray Alfala that was kind of the catalyst of where this started. He and Graham Bolin that were battling for about the 20th position uh, looks like it was just a bump gone wrong. And again, nothing malicious, nothing where we've seen too much three wide at this point. And... Uh, Try to see it one more time. You can see the M80 car in the middle there. And yep, Graham Bolin, Ray Alfala on the top side. Again, Bolin was trying to help push him along. It gets Alfala loose. And honestly, Steven Wilson may have gotten the worst end of it there in the middle as he kind of made a little bit of contact pretty heavy with Alfala. He got tagged uh, by the three of Jonathan Delaney as well and uh, caught a little bit of the inside wall also. Not, not a track you want a little bit of aero damage. Well, we had seen up towards the front, Blake, guys pushing right from the get-go. How much of that is the push or how much of it is where the push happened coming off the corner when those cars are coming off of the banking seems to not be a place you want to make a touch like that? It's honestly just how lined up you are with the car. I wouldn't say that you can you can push somebody in the middle of the corner here at Atlanta. We saw the NASCAR Cup Series and even in my own experience running this combination in NIS, you can be very, uh, almost too aggressive sometimes with the pushes that you have, but as long as you're aligned perfectly and that car in front of you isn't turning his wheel too far to left or right, as soon as you hit, you can pretty much, you can push him almost as, as hard as you want to. Well, we have got a long way to go until we crown a 2024 eNASCAR Series champion. But if you want to stay up to date with the latest news and updates from around the world of eNASCAR, then sign up today by scanning the QR code on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Stay in the loop with iRacing, the official simulation partner of NASCAR. We have got a whole lot of racing as this road to $500,000 continues this year. And we invite you to be a part of it all season long. A couple of cars down pit road from the tail end of the field. It's maybe a little bit more than half the final number, Blake, of cars who decide to come down and pit, mostly cars who are running towards the back, but not exclusively. And you've got a word now. You've with Stephen Wilson on the radio, maybe. Looks like we'll let him go. Lights off on top of the pace car. We'll let Steven jump back over to his team radio. I'm seeing the first car off of pit road, Dylan Alt P17. When you talked us through that race analysis, the fuel window was showing kind of right at or past halfway as is. Is this a fuel decision just to give yourself a little bit of insurance if we're looking to make it a one-stopper? Well, you, you can certainly go a little bit further, and, and I like the call for a majority of this field. If you're in the back half, we've seen already a lot of drivers who have been able to kind of work their way up from the back of the field. Heck, Briar LaPrade, we talked about him in Vegas last week, the march he had through the field, started 31st. He's in the 15th spot right now, but I would say uh, that we're still not going to be able to make it 
uh, on fuel. Tires are going to matter just a little bit, but I like the call. If you don't have the track position right now, come down and get some fuel. And if we do get a run to where green flag pit stops are going to be a cycle, you want to try and stay packed up with the draft as long as possible to continue to make up that time. We'll pick his car off it in. Jordy Lopez continues to lead at the front of the field. His BS competition plus four takes the green flag. Back underway. Good jump for the Donnie car on the inside. Maybe too good of a jump, though, because white and low going to be hooked up topside. Watch that 53 car in the high lane. And can they build some speed and get to the Nani car? Well, Jordy's waiting for the 33 to get to his bumper. It's one of those cases if you're the leader and you can get a great shot of it here at Jordy Lopez looking down into the corner, but down the back straightaway, all he's doing is looking in his mirror. He's trying to figure out how much momentum does Taylor Hurst have? Where is he going to push me? And do I have enough momentum to clear? And Lopez was in a tough spot being the leader on that restart because if you go early, this is what kind of happens. Everybody forms up on the top side. You don't have that push initially into the corner. And you can see that bottom lane kind of start to break up as a result. And Dylan Duvall gets the worst end of it. Not a whole lot of momentum or, or cars in that middle lane. So he was quickly up at the top five. And now he's outside the top 15, maybe outside the top 20 by the time we get back to the start finish line. Yeah, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, Blake. Seemingly an evil Knievel inspired paint scheme on that Nitro Cross Ford of Dylan Duvall. But yeah, he did not want to end up in the middle. Drops a couple of spots. May have a lifeline, though. I think the 48 went to the middle. Now the 20 drops down for the outside line. That's Tinsley. So that's going to add some strength in numbers to the cars in the middle still not what they have inside or out but at least there are some cars in the middle trying to get that lane moving right now it's about six or seven compared to the 10 15 that are on the inside and the outside lanes and i'll tell you what it's somewhat surprising that this middle lane is as competitive as it is and you think about Daytona, right? It's really hard to get this middle line working because you're kind of getting side drafted from both sides of you, right? And you're not able to carry that momentum. But here at Atlanta, you have a lot more control in that middle line, despite the fact that everybody's formed up on the high side. You can see them kind of holding that bottom line at bay, pinching them down a little bit. And just how much narrower that racing line is it allows that middle line to continue to make up some spots even though the banking and as far as the width of this turn is the exact same as Daytona for some reason here in Atlanta we're able to see that middle lane be a lot more competitive in a pack than uh, in what you would see at Daytona not a lot of space inside and out when they're three wide like they are now but the middle is holding its own and in fact gaining a little bit that time through the turn as the 51 of donovan strauss leads the way you'll also notice a couple of cars there down getting beneath that red line now in real life that's out of bounds drivers aren't allowed to go down there here in iRacing no rule about whether you can go beneath that uh, white striped and red line down there on the bottom of the racetrack. So particularly in the trioval, we're not going to see it a ton here early. You'll see a couple of drivers running down there for, uh, for the early portion of this race. But that uh, kind of cut to the start finish line, you are allowed to go down there. It's not out of bounds. It is part of the racing surface here in Atlanta. Well, let's step into the world of Coke Spiced and go on board with your Coca-Cola on board camera with Zach Novak.
From afar, it looks like we're taking the 285 around Atlanta, although over the course of tonight's race, we'll do two times the length of Interstate 285. <laughs> but it looks just about the same. I don't know where I'd rather be, stuck on the freeway or middle three wide because it has not settled down. And that middle lane to Blake, in fact, now pulling the slight advantage to the cars on the bottom with the eight car up front. Caden Honeycutt leading the charge through the middle, still trying to get all the way up to the 89 car and big swing left. Hello, Michael Cozy going to undercut the eight car and it'll stunt the momentum in the middle lane just for a moment. But it's only going to be a moment and you'll see Cozy able to get some help behind him and Parker White. But with that middle lane and how well it is formed up right now, it, it's a tough time to try and be on the bottom right now. Cozy, Parker White, Jordy Lopez, a couple of our early contenders up here. There, there's just nowhere to go when the middle and the top lane are formed up as well as they are. And we're, we've seen a lot of commitment, Evan. We talk about it all the time when we come to these type of drafting tracks, that having some friends, having people that you can commit to and push and know that they're going to help you out in the early portion of the race, that's a big factor. And already early on, we see a lot of these drivers, teams uh, that they have on the eNASCAR side, as well as some technical alliances that they make kind of before the race. They're working out right here, and a lot of them staying committed to one another as we see a change up front. Garrett Lowe was the race leader. Now it's Caden Honeycutt, who, by the way, started in 39th in this race. Very quickly been able to trek his way up through the field. And he did it with the help of this man, Donovan Strauss. He's doing a good job. The outside has the advantage. George's own right there. A couple of cars back in line. Three wide, still seven or so rows back. But Caden Honeycutt gets his first lap led of the afternoon. After starting this race in 39th position, he's out into the lead before the one-third marker in this Atlanta 100. Inside lines where the speed's at now. Spearheaded by Tyler Gary and company. He's pushed by the 20 Wyatt Tinsley. So the middle lane dying out just a little bit. This lead pack, though, is your top 39 cars. It's everybody on the lead lap. Last time by separated by only two and a half seconds. And here comes Garrett Lowe again through the middle. Just as quickly, those slices to the bottom. And now Casey Kerwin high to mid. The 77 car making some moves as he tries to get his first lap led of the day. A lot of shifting in lanes there. And particularly for this facility, how special it would be for Donovan Strauss to perhaps go to victory lane again. He's run Legends cars here at the Atlanta Motor Speedway for years. And for him to have the opportunity to, to at least compete on this big track virtually for him, you know, you, you want to be able to go out and win anywhere you can. But I think for Strauss in particular, this would be a very special place for him to, well, not get his first E-NASCAR win. He was able to do that in the championship race last season. But to get his first win of the season and try to lock his way into his first playoffs, it would be a special place to do it as he runs in the top five. The yeah, home racetrack, always a special one, only about an hour away. Uh, he lives from the racetrack here in Hampton. Uh, would be a fun one and is at least in the mix early here at the virtual Atlanta Motor Speedway. Kwame Scott, we talk about some of the other drivers in the field through this one and kind of how their night is shaking out. Well, there's a look at the 36 Chevrolet, the driver out of Bronx, New York, top side right now in those ever so familiar Sudoku colors. He's on the doorstep of the top 10 looking for some more. That's the 54 car in front of him of Daniel Falkenham. You get a really good gauge here. We, we saw it at Daytona, how much these drivers are lifting in the pack. You're off the throttle so much throughout this entire uh, lap here, and you, you wouldn't necessarily anticipate that at Atlanta Motor Speedway. You talk about drafting tracks all the time, but especially where Kwame is and around where everybody's kind of shuffling out of line. You're that fifth, sixth, seventh car in line. You're doing a lot of lifting. You're trying to gauge how close you can get to that car in front of you. You're just not trying to give him a bad bump like we saw a little bit earlier with Graham Bolin and Ray Alfala, which, by the way, doesn't look like that damage has hurt that 69 car too much as he's almost catching up to Tyler Gary leading the inside line, and Alfala found his way back up into the top 10. Uh, another driver, again, I competed against him in NIS here and was, uh, again, he's as good as you can get trying to find the right time to make some aggressive moves. And Malik Gray has found himself up into the top 20 after a not-so-seller start uh, in terms of the starting grid, but has found his way back up here towards the front.
He's somebody else who started back in the 30s, but is fighting for positions inside of the top 10. His Spire Motorsports number seven Chevy top side right now. Uh, a good perspective. The car in front of him dives to the middle. That was the 38 car, Michael Cozy Jr. And even on the front stretch here, the one element that Atlanta Motor Speedway has played that you don't see at Daytona Talladega is that apron on the front stretch. It's present at all the other intermediate one and a half mile racetracks, but it's especially sketchy here, A, because of the style of race, and it also B, again, those distinct kinks on the quad oval as opposed to a trioval front stretch, which is kind of a more gradual sweeping bank those distinct kinks approaching and leaving the start finish make some of those moves when drivers look to the bottom maybe a moment to stop your breath it, it is and it, it's something you have to be aware of if you're that second that third car in line if that car in front of you is looking like they're going to cross some of those uh, parts of the racetrack where the banking shifts just a little bit that's enough to try and upset these race cars and how about the run for Caden Honeycutt up here I know we were talking to Raja Carruth a little bit earlier on he got a NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series win and Caden Honeycutt has a little bit of in real life experience at this racetrack finished sixth this past year in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series in an Al Nice truck and did a tremendous job in that race kind of biding his time had a truck that was handling not to his liking, but was able to manage a sixth place finish. And we turned things over to the eNASCAR world, gave him a fixed setup, and look at where he is right at the front of the field. He's enjoying the view up front, but for the moment, Tyler Gary sticks a nose in front. He looks to lead his first lap of the afternoon, closing in on halfway home at Atlanta. You're watching round number three of the 2024 eNASCAR Coca Cola iRacing Series. Every time you sit behind the wheel, you buckle up for the unexpected. You get ready to take on the competition, embrace yourself for the chaos, the speed, the weather, the unknown. But above all, when strapping in, you put trust in yourself, your intuition, making your guide to win, your drive to win. He's a winner in this. And nothing is going to stop you from winning. When you want to be the best, you can't settle for the rest. For anything on iRacing, there's just one name you need, Mo Cody. We now provide the best of the best in setups, paint schemes, coaching, broadcasting, and event organization. With cars across all four license classes, we have what you need to hit the track with confidence. Grab a subscription and save money while going fast at MaconeySetupShop.com forward slash subscriptions. And remember, at Maconey Setup Shop, there are setups, but your victories. March is Women's History Month, and NASCAR is proud to recognize the accomplishments of past and present icons within the sport. From drivers like Sarah Christian, the first woman to compete in a NASCAR Cup Series race, to track presidents like Julie Giese, Lori Collier Warren, Natasha Causey, and Jill Gregory, the women leading the venues in which we race across the country. All of these women have helped pave the way for future generations. We are proud to celebrate them and all women year round. Racing's virtual Atlanta Motor Speedway, where coverage of tonight's race is brought to you by Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. Is it the best Coke ever? Try and decide. By Logitech G. Through design, engineering, and a love of driving games, Logitech G takes racing simulation to another level. Logitech G, the official wheel and pedals of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. By Maconey Setup Shop. Our setups, your victories. And by NASCAR. 
March is Women's History Month, and eNASCAR is proud to recognize the accomplishments of past and present women in the sport. The contributions made by these women to the sport should be celebrated as they help fuel NASCAR's past, present, and future. Five laps away from halfway home in this Atlanta 100 third race of this 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. And Blake, kind of hard to get a gauge on who's in control. We've seen just about everybody get a crack at the top spot. You got race leaders as high as P1 right now, Casey Kerwin, who's led eight. And as low as Matthew Zawak, who's led laps, but is 31st at the moment based on a little bit of strategy. Well, I'll tell you one driver that was in control pretty well over the course of that commercial break, and that was Caden Honeycutt, who was dead to right sideways in the middle of the straightaway, got a bad bump on his outside from Tyler Gary, and somehow was able to corral it up and has gathered it back up and is fighting back inside the top 10. Again, we've seen track position can change so quickly here at this racetrack and got to give so much credit to these drivers. And so they're leaning on each other up at the front of the field, four wide. Kerwin's out of shape. He saves it. Garrett Lowe back to the race lead. I don't know how they didn't wreck there. Tinsley got loose on the inside, slid up, and they were forced to make room four wide for a moment. Somehow, we stay green. Honeycutt forcing his way to the bottom as the 12 remains desperately looking for some help in the middle lane. Novak had to jump up and join the party. The 77 to Curlin again. Big sweepy to move down to the inside. And I think that was a bullet dodge. That almost got really ugly right here at a turn two last time by instead we keep on going but maybe things that had settled down slightly right back to the three wide mix for the race lead gotta say when are we going to start talking about casey Kerwin as a super speedway specialist i know there's a lot of names that we kind of circle on the entry list whenever we come to these types of racetracks as somebody who's going to be a factor but i can't remember the last time we were in a race at daytona talladega or even here at atlanta motor speedway where casey Kerwin was not making an impact and making it immediately. Started back in 15th, jumped up to the middle, kind of made that lane work, and now he's trying to do his best to, you know, stay out front, control both lanes, try to lead as many laps as he can. And again, it's consistency over the last, I would say, pretty much since the next-gen era began in this series. Casey Kerwin has been, I think, the most consistent driver that we've seen who can run up front, keep his track position, and at the end of the day probably has the best results in terms of super speedway finishes out of anybody who's run this series the last two or three years. Notably not the first time we've seen drivers run at fixed setups this year, but it is this season. Fixed setups in the season exhibition race at Daytona gave us a little bit of a taste of things to come. Of course, this is also the second to last race of segment number one here in 2024. This four race opening segment, the shortest of all three this year. The other two are going to be five races in length. A cash prize to the segment champion. That's a big deal, but I think uh, everybody expects to walk away in the green blank over $500,000 up for grabs. The biggest thing that jumps out to me about these segments, and you and Alan touched on it during Countdown to Green, were those playoff points. That's something that we have not seen in series history. No, well, it continues to give these drivers a reason uh, to continue to try to be aggressive and make those moves. Sometimes these drivers, I don't want to say that they get complacent in any sense, but you pick up a win and it gives you a little bit of comfort or a little bit of a lift in case, you know, something happens and you're able to kind of rely on that win to get you through as long as you can stay in the top 20. Well, now you continue to have an incentive that even if you can't go after a win, because pretty much you're chasing wins at that point, at least that was the case in the past, that now you're, you're still points racing in a way and you can also garner some playoff points out of it again these races aren't long enough to where we're having stages to where we can give out playoff points so i think this segment idea is a great incentive for these drivers to continue fighting and for those drivers that you know maybe they have a really rough start to the year that it gives them a chance in segment two or segment three to compete for some money compete for some playoff points if they're able to grab a win and turn their season around so uh, it's a great job i think to make this series more competitive and continue to reward great performance well as the number 11 was sideways there from besides jimmy mullis and he's able to collect it up vicente salas an amazing job that he did saving that race car after contact with garrett mains unfortunately for him it's going to drop kick him about 15 positions but 
Evan, that's about the third time or so I've been certain that we're about to call a wreck, and it somehow has not happened. Yeah, that ERA Omega uh, machine in the Micro Center Toyota uh, nearly wrecked it, and credit to Jimmy Mullis. We were on board with him. Didn't flinch. Uh, let's take a second look at how that one unfolded. Again, we were on board with Mullis in the middle, but it was the 11 on the bottom, just on his own. A little bit of the apron there, upset the car, and then he gets hit from behind once and then twice on the left rear. It's a good piece of driving by both of those race cars to, to hang on, save it, and we continue under rain flag conditions. Now past the halfway point, closing in now to the end of this race. I think to finish that point on the segment, my favorite part of it is it's all or nothing, right? Much like uh, you'll see the playoff points in the NASCAR Cup Series, these uh, playoff bonuses and the championship prizes that'll go with a segment win is only did a winner. We bumped up the prize pool in this series to over $500,000 this year. That was prize increases to all the drivers in the top 20 for the season payout, 100,000 to the champ, but you can go all the way down to P7, Blake, and get a $10,000 prize. It was not that long ago that that was the grand champion prize. Yeah. So those That's numbers went up across the board, but they did not give that same treatment to the driver segments. You got to win it to get the bonus points. You got to win it to get the $3,000 prize. And that's it. The only thing you get for finishing second in the stage is, I guess you scored a lot of points in that segment. That's all you get out of that. Uh, I think that's one thing with Zach Novak. You could see a former series champion in Kerwin leading Novak in second. He was the driver that when he won this championship, it was $10,000. I'm sure he's thinking, man, you know, I'd love to win a championship, but if it could have happened a year or two later, I don't think I would have minded it that much. And he's got plenty of opportunities to make some more money and continue to write history. Novak, one of the best. He's up top of big issues towards the back. They scatter in turn no number caution. four. Still out of control, the 36 car. That was Kwame Scott. There's no yellow on the racetrack yet. Scott is immobilized down in the grass after four cars were into the outside wall in turn three but no caution we stay green and that has absolutely broken up this lead pack it's Kwame scott that got tagged on a bad bump from garrett mains put him into the wall ray alfala got a piece of it as well some heavy damage there but again nobody really ever spun fully around and Again, with this series, it is automatic yellows that are thrown. So if the sim throws it, the caution will come out. And unfortunately there for a lot of drivers, this kind of forces a big breakup in the pack. About the top 18 or so are the only few that have stayed with the lead pack. We'll see it one more time. Look at that bright yellow and blue car on the top hand part of your screen. Kwame Scott, Garrett Baines, Ray Alfala. But nobody gets fully turned. And as a result, we stay green. And he got the worst of it, and Scott is going to uh, limp to pit road. Uh, his night uh, in contention effectively done. Uh, looks like Ray Alfala also on pit road currently, and then a couple of other cars slow towards the back. The second that happened to Blake, I think it was Tyler Gary said on the radio, we saw how much that pack separated. He said, if we stop racing each other now, we're going to pull away. He's trying to take advantage of the discombobulation and separate this group from the rest of the field. I don't know if everybody else is subscribing to that. You can see Honeycutt leads the inside with Salas there. I think they're going to continue to race. So it'll be interesting to see if the car 17th on the back can catch back up. But the favor is certainly in this lead pack. It's still a big one, mind you, but it is about half the size of what it was prior to that accident. Well, I would say that, yeah, you probably would want to form up single file, but pit stops for many of these drivers are just around the corner in terms of how far that they can go on fuel. We're not in a situation right now where, you know, if you're Honeycutt or Salas or any of those drivers that are leading the bottom side right now, if you lift and just try to get in line and ride around, you're not going to save any time. You're going to lose a little bit of track position pitting. And we have seen, Evan, time and time again, green flag pit stops here are sketchy this is that second pack that's trying their best to get a little bit of the draft and they may just be able to do it but they're trying to form up their agenda is pretty easy we have to get organized we have to line up single file and we have to try and chase down this lead pack they were able to make up about two tenths that last lap uh, but for them they have to get organized and do it quickly it's about seven or eight cars or so that are hanging on to the top 16. 
Yeah, that was a good look at the gap between the lead pack uh, and that second group. The lead pack we look at now, uh, they have about, you mentioned, nine or so lead lap cars in that group. They've got about 11 total. There's a couple of lap down cars in that pack, Blake. If these leaders keep going two by two and that secondary pack works together, can they close the gap? Or is the fact that they have less cars in the group going to hurt them no matter how well they work together? Can they make up that difference? Well, it's not going to make up that difference if Luza gets into the wall again. And unfortunately, he was leading that second packer towards the front of it. He gets into the wall. They had lost time that previous lap. And I would imagine that they're going to lose even more so. And Evan, at least the way that it raced for me was that if you had about five or six cars, you could catch a pack that was racing side by side like this because the amount of time that you're losing with that outside lane coming down to the bottom and trying to side draft that bottom lane, it slows everybody down. Um, but I think we're not going to have to worry about that too much. I'm hearing some drivers calling out that they're going to be pitting this time by. Oh, and it's going to be a big stack up on the inside. Novak, it's turned in front of the field. The five no goes into the outside wall again. No caution, but everybody on the bottom, Blake, you referenced it on the grid that they do not use that entry into three and ride the apron here on the sim. They ride out of turn four. They checked up, and there is Novak. He got spit out of line. And you have to pit from the racing line here at Atlanta Motor Speedway. There's no other way that you can do it. It's so hard to get these cars slowed down. And honestly, it's kind of the reason in real life that we saw a change because a couple of green flag pit cycles came through in real life. I remember sitting in the grandstands here a couple of years ago for the first race, and that was kind of the cause of a couple of incidents was drivers trying to slow down and get down to pit road. Well, here at iRacing, we're not so worried about that, at least right now. And uh, it creates some issues there. But again, Novak, hard contact in the outside wall, but didn't get spun, so we continue to ride under green. He loses a ton of time. We'll see where he blends out. More takers to pit road this time through. Derek Bordeaux, Dylan Duvall, and Jimmy Mullis, the latest group of cars on the pit road. Daniel Falkenham is second on the racetrack. That is his green 54 interstate batteries. He says that he will be pitting this time. So does the 38 machine behind him. That's the generator Ford, a Michael Cozy Jr. And you can see Cozy backs it off a little bit. He doesn't want to be on the bumper of the 54 knowing that they're coming to pit road. He takes a big swing, a little bit of tire smoke. I think they get it down to pit road speed of 45 miles an hour. But it was very clear the 38 had no intentions of riding the bumper of the car in front of him knowing they'd both be coming down. Well, again, I think at this juncture that, yes, you want to get on a pit road as quickly as possible, but there's at least a little bit of leeway that if you leave with a pack, uh, you can probably give up a little time. The last thing you want to do is miss pit road and speed uh, because it is so easy to do here at this racetrack. Now, this second pack, most of those cars have continued to stay out and stay together, uh, and... You know, these, these were some cars that came in and pit when we had our, our only caution flag of the evening at lap 14. So they can go a little bit further uh, than the rest of the field. They're still going to have to pit, but I like this call that if you have the numbers, and right now they have about five cars, that's about as much as you would need to make up as much time as possible. With how broken up the rest of the field is, I would stay out until it ran dry right now because you're making up time over all those cars who are kind of scattered coming out of pit road. Yeah, these 10 cars who lead the field, to your point, came in and topped off on that early yellow. Now, some of the drivers who pitted with them have since come back and pitted more so in line with everybody else. But it is very clearly this group of five up front who are working together and staying out for the long run. Last lap for Matt Busa, a 30.041. How does that stack up with some of the other packs? Well, Caden Honeycutt, the lead car of those who have pitted, he put down a 29.688, now a 29.837. So they are a little bit quicker than this lead pack. So curious if Busa, Ottinger, and company can stay aggressive but continue to work together because this will work if they're putting down faster lap times, Blake, to your point, than those discombobulated cars who came off of pit road. If you're losing time, though, to those cars, then this is only going to hurt you the longer you stay out. Well, for now, you spit out the numbers there. They're significantly slower than the rest of the field, so, but they're on the lead lap. So if anything were to happen, they basically get to trap the rest of the cars a lap down, and they'll 
have fresh tires by the time they come out. On the right-hand side, you can see kind of a, a strategy race that played out in its own. Keegan Leahy was able to escape for the win after Ottinger and Bias collected each other on the last lap. You can see Bias riding around in that third position behind, well, guess who, Evan? It seems like racing always works this way, Nick Ottinger. But if I were any of those spotters and crew chiefs on the box for any of these drivers, I would be taking great note of the fact that of the cars that pit, they are making up about a second a lap or so over this pack and yeah you're going to be able to make up that time when you come down and get tires but with about 15 to go they're going to be three wide you're going to have nowhere to go by the time that you get there so uh i initially liked the call uh well guess what i'd probably adjust for that i'd want to pit as soon as possible if i were to sleep pack and I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to make the strategy play but then when you see the intervals going not in your favor, call an audible, mix it up, get to pit road and try to do some damage limitation. We'll see if they stick by it or if they are hard committed to this number. There's also more cars catching them, but it's not going to help them. Those are the drivers that they're fighting against for the win. Garrett Lowe, the 89 car, that white and green Ford topside is the lead car of those who has pitted and can go the distance. He is unlapping himself. That's a perfect visual for how much quicker that other pack is, is that they drove down caught them and right now are doing a pretty good job at passing them with ease on the outside so perfect illustration of the speed difference there the only thing that i could think of is if you're in this lead pack maybe you have the potential to, to take two tires or take a little bit less fuel uh, which honestly probably wouldn't help out, but that could be something that these drivers are looking to employ. Curious to see if Busa and the rest of the pack can hang on to these cars in front of them. At least that'll make it a little bit easier, but again, they still only have about 10 or 15 laps or so at the most that they would be able to stay out. Again, they last pit at lap 14. The rest of the field it was about 66 or 67 laps that they were able to make it on fuel. Uh, so those that lap 14 group, they would be close, but it wouldn't be quite enough to make it the distance. And where these cars run in relation to each other is important if there were to be a yellow because Michael guessed all the way on through Jimmy Mullis have been able to unlap themselves. Now, Tyler Carey, Wyatt Tinsley, 19th on back. Those cars who have pitted are still a lap down. That would not be ideal if we were to have a yellow flag in this race. So at least part of the strategy call for Busa and company falls to the wayside by the fact that so many of those lead lap cars have gotten back to the lead lap and wouldn't it be caught so far out if a yellow were to come again i think at this point though they may be committed to just running this all the way no matter what uh, i was thinking these guys were also going to try to latch onto the back blake of that group that flew by him but it's kind of disintegrated the group that was leading i mean boost is way off of ottinger bias wilson and, and femi are pretty close together behind him but I think they've decided that this is it. Here they come to pit road. Nick Ottinger is down. So is Matt Busa. And we will see just how much damage has been done as they look to blend out onto the racetrack. And these leaders got to come all the way around the racetrack back to the front stretch in order to just get even with those cars. So we'll see how they blend back out into traffic. Well, again, 20 laps is a lot of time to try and make up, and if they have fresh tires, it is going to make a difference. I just wonder if you're these cars up here that have been fighting for the last couple of laps, you think you're fighting for the win, guess what you can do? You can go three wide, and even if somebody's half a second faster than you, they have nowhere to go on the racetrack. They, they can maybe go down to the tri-oval and try to pass you uh, in, again, the area that's not out of bounds, but at that point, your fresh tires aren't going to help you at all, so it, it's a difficult balance that these drivers are having to work out here. You can see Tucker Minter still out. He and Zelensky along with Dylan Alt still have to come down pit road. There is also a group, Evan, that came down and pit on lap 50 that was led by Michael Guest, Colin Keister, and Colin Bowden. They're going to be the ones that inherit the race lead. They're going to be able to make it, and for now, they're about three seconds in front of Garrett Lowe, Malik Ray, and the rest of the pack. Uh, but I think they'll be caught by those drivers with the fresher tires, so I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, they pitted right at halfway on their own and would be able to go the distance 
More takers to pit road that time. That will leave only Michael Guest, as I think the only car who has yet to pit that cannot go the scheduled distance. Still thinking the 45 needs to come to pit road for service. Then it would hand things off to Keister and Bowden, who pitted it halfway on their own, trying their own strategy. Garrett Lowe is your current net leader, we'll call it, of everybody else who has come down and can make it for sure. He rides right now in the number four position. Uh, the intervals are not that far, though. I mean, they're going to be on top of these three up front regardless as they continue to close in. Now less than 20 laps to go at Atlanta. Guest continues to lead. He has been out there for 69 laps. We'll see just how much longer that 45 car can go before he finally needs to bow down to Peru. We also got to think about the fact that there's a couple of lap cars that are kind of intermingled with this lead pack. I mean, look at Timmy Holmes right now. He's technically the leader of this line, but he's being scored right now one lap down just in front of Michael Guest, who could put him two down if he tried to make the move. Zach Novak, a little bit of damage that he has, but he's also a lap down. So these lap cars are definitely going to be a factor at the end of this race. And how hard they're racing up here, that's going to allow that second pack to catch them a little bit easier. And a correction, my timing and scoring is absolutely showing to Michael Guest has been out there for 71 laps, but I went back to the tape. He pitted at the midway point, so he's in the same game, I believe, as Keister and Bowden. So just to correct that, it's, it may be showing wrong, but uh, he is, in theory, good to go in this battle for the win against Keister and against Bowden. Those three pitting at the halfway point, trying to hold off everybody else. Low and company are about 1.7 seconds back, but are making up about a second every single lap. They will be on the scene shortly. And Michael Guest knows it. Here they come with the speed off of two. And they're going to get to them, if not this lap, maybe the next time by. Yeah, they're definitely going to latch on. They're less than a second behind that pack. And, you know, that's that's some great work that they did, being able to organize and, and be able to, to run these guys down. It's not just easy enough that you have fresh tires and you're going to be able to easily run them down. It took a lot of work. Everybody's staying in line. Those third and fourth cars in line giving uh, what is Casey Kerwin and Malik Ray the best pushes. And we saw these two teammates they were working very well together, got some great finishes, uh, or at least crossed the finish line up front at Daytona uh, a couple of weeks ago in the season opener. But now Malik Ray, Casey Kerwin, a lethal combination. They're catching this lead pack, and they're going to take their momentum. I know they're going to make a move somewhere, but do they go high, do they go low? Right now, they look to the outside, but Michael Guest and company currently on the outside lane. There's lapped cars in this mix as well. You're looking for the black and white 45 of Michael Guest. Fourth car in line, if you look at this from a broad view. He's on the outside, pushed by the 66 of Keister, then the 17 of Bowden. Those are the three cars who pitted at halfway and should be able to go the distance. The seven of Malik Ray, the white and green Chevy midfield, pushed by Kerwin. They are are there big shove into turn number one the advantage has gone but there are lapped cars in the middle of this battle amongst the leaders gonna make working with each other tricky coming to 12 to go but the thing is these lap cars they're they're fast you know that some of them have a little bit of damage but they're capable of staying up front some of them have fresher tires than the leader and honestly if you're one of these cars in the pack you can use that to your advantage you can push somebody out to the lead go faster as a result and you would still get the finish that you would want so these lap cars gonna be a factor but Again, if you're in this pack, you have to figure out how to use them to your benefit, which they can be of use as Cozy rides in second behind your race leader and Seth the Merchant, uh, who is a couple car lengths ahead now of this pack that's all fighting behind some of the lap traffic. You throw of that set, the merchant ends up as your race leader. He has lapped cars in front of and behind him in the white and blue number 14 Toyota. He's got a buffer running blocker right now is that 99 of Matthew Zwack protecting the merchant from the next lead lap car, that black and white 45 Toyota of Michael Guest. Here comes Malik Ray, though, has been working so good with his Spire Motorsports teammate Casey. Kerwin, they go to the bottom. Seth sees in a response, has to go low to protect the inside. Eight laps to go at Atlanta, and they're on his bumper.
By the way, an update that pack that Matt Busa led and stayed out, they are 11 seconds back. And I think at this juncture, that's going to be a little bit too much time that they're going to have to make up to be a part of it. But you see all these different strategies coming together, a bunch of lap cars that are a part of the mix as well. Demerchant trying to control the race, and he has control in the bottom. Again, those are some lap cars out there that he does not have to worry about until you get back to Michael Guest. But the Spire Motorsports cars nearly touching the grass. Two-car tandem. Is it going to be enough to clear them? Yes, it will. Malik Ray to the point for now at Atlanta. We talked about the opportunity the apron provided earlier in this race. The seven's going to get all the way to the lead, but it's going to leave his teammate hanging. Kerwin could not clear the 45 of guest tucks back in line and Amalie Gray without his teammate who's been glued to his hip since the pit cycle seven to go this time by Ray leads the inside he is your leader the 89 car top side Garrett Lowe is the first lead lap car up top you can kind of ignore the five and ignore the 55 yes they will play a factor in who wins this race but they not they cannot win this race those are lapped cars first and second in line on the outside. Keep that in mind as Malik Ray goes high to try to get a little bit of side draft off them. If that outside benefits, oh, the big swing for Garrett Lowe. Oh. To the middle, now back to the outside. Oh, Kerwin, is he going to be able to save it? They're four wide in the middle of the pack. The 45 of Michael Guest sliding through, and it looks like they finally collect each other. It could not last forever, and a caution flag comes out as one car comes to rest down on the apron. It is the 48 of Graham Bolin with five laps to go. They got all sorts of sideways down in the trioval that started with that block you mentioned, Evan, of Garrett Lowe. And they tried to sort it out, but unfortunately, four wide here was just not enough room for them to try to make it happen. Yeah, I know spring training is in full swing, and that means the only thing I can call that is a balk. He went from the outside to the middle, seemed committed to the lane, and then all of a sudden kind of changed his mind. You'll see the big swing left-hand side of your screen. It all started by low, went to the middle, and then seemingly changed his mind, tried to squeeze back up in front of the 41, and it just accordion them all back. And as it always seems to be in these super speedway races, where it starts, those cars drive away, and it was in the rear where you see the 42 car get turned around. And it is finally, for all the incidents that we got away with, finally the second yellow of the night. And after all of that, Garrett Lowe, the big block starts it. Well, Garrett Lowe scored as your race leader. We'll take one last opportunity to step aside. When we come back, it is E-NASCAR overtime at Atlanta. Garrett Lowe, can he hang on? We'll be going to a green-white checker when we come back. Every time you sit behind the wheel, you buckle up for the unexpected. You get ready to take on the competition, embrace yourself for the chaos, the speed, the weather, the unknown. But above all, when strapping in, you put trust in yourself, your intuition, making your guide to win, your drive to win. He's a winner in this. And nothing is going to stop you from winning. Did you see that? Yeah. Hear that? 
Feel that. Is this how you prove you earn the crown? Is in his DNA. How you shut up the haters? I love it. Handle the heat? Who's gonna make the move? Gonna be a must win. Is this a shooting star? Rock star? Superstar? Okay, okay. Let's all take a deep breath. Because once we peel out, there's no looking back. You ready? Back in Atlanta, where coverage of tonight's race is brought to you by Coke Zero Sugar. Is it the best Coke ever? Try and decide. By Logitech. Through design, engineering, and a love of driving games, Logitech G takes racing simulation to another level. The official wheel and pedals of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. And by Sudoku. From fueling your favorite NASCAR teams to filling up at the pump, Sudoku is trusted to help vehicles perform at their peak. Sudoku, performance is what we do. We are headed to E NASCAR overtime. Attempt number one at a green white checker. Garrett Lowe, Malik Ray on the front row. Green flag in the air. We also have a group about 20th on back that elected to take tires. They have to pass about 20 cars, but they'll have some fresh tires if they can get enough laps to make it happen. As Malik Ray dives to the inside, he'll go to the middle on Garrett Lowe. Michael Guest emerges with the race lead as they continue to work three wide into turn three. They got to get back to the white flag for it to oh. be an official big slide for Colin Bowden. He saves it four wide, spinning off of four. Do they get to the stripe? They don't. The lights come on before, and it's a big one in Atlanta. Well, I thought that was going to happen in three with that huge slide from Colin Bowden. It checked them up just enough to finally set them off off of turn number four. There was maybe a glimmer of hope up front for Gaston and company that they would get to the white before the yellow. It was not meant to be. And we'll re-rack them and stack them and go again. Saw it several times just over the course of that lap, especially on the bottom, some drivers getting out of shape and my goodness, what an incredible save that Colin Bowden had. Unfortunately, when he did that, it kind of stacked up and checked up the line behind them. And when you have cars that even in 25th are thinking, hey, I got a shot in this thing with some fresh tires, they're not going to lift. They're, they can't even see that wreck that's probably happening in front of them. And that's exactly what we're going to see. You can take a look. You could kind of pick out Colin Bowden sliding a little bit there, stacking up the line. And unfortunately here at Atlanta, there could be some violent impacts here on the front straightaway as everybody's trying to get to the line. And, you know, we, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to get to the white flag, Evan, as they were crashing. It was so close to whether we were going to see this race through to the end or not. But looks like it's going to take another attempt as one more look for Donovan Strauss. Cool. And Sometimes uh, sometimes it works out perfectly. It certainly did for Donovan there. I don't think I'd blame if his eyes were closed through that one and still finds the opening. That wreck takes out some cars that had been in this race and in contention for the win all night long. Tyler Gary had led five laps at the Merchant Five. Matt Busa, 11. That's third most out of anybody. Just some of the names involved in that accident. And as mentioned, we will try it again. We will go to attempt number two at Enas Car Overtime. We are capped at three. All that needs to happen is for us to get to the white flag for this race to be official. At that point, the checkered and only the checkered flag will end this race. However, if the yellow like we just saw comes out before the white flag is taken, we will try again. Uh, but if we don't get it this time, we'll be up against the cap. Again, three attempts is the maximum. If we do get a yellow before the white flag on that third and final attempt, the race would end at the moment of caution. It's an important distinction. Lights out on top of the pace car. A lot of cars limping off pit road. Blake damaged cars just trying to get back in the draft. Be in contention to score some points in this one. They got Michael Guest up front. He's been there all night. Colin Keister kind of coming onto the scene here late. The Semi-Cube 66 car. Garrett Lowe's in third. He's led 18 laps tonight. Can he close the deal in the 89 machine? 
We know that he's capable of, and he's been in this position a number of times. You think back to last season and kind of the run he went on uh, that we even heard in the pre-race show after uh, his great effort at Charlotte Motor Speedway last year. Just Garrett Lowe was a regular fixture at the front of the field, regardless of really the type of track that we went to. has got enough experience running up here at the front of the field, and it's just where you want to make your move. It's so difficult, especially here, to decide when you want to try to step out of line, when you want to try to make that race-winning move. And with the fact that this trap package is realistic, you likely need somebody to go with you. But where are you going to get that? I, I don't see any teammates, any friends behind Garrett Lowe who they want to win themselves. They're not going to just help push him or anybody else up here to the win. There are already Coke Series wins in the trophy cabinets of the drivers in the top five. Highest running driver without a win, Colin Bowden, outside of row number three as he restarts from P6. Let's try this again. Attempt number two at E-NASCAR overtime. Green flag in the air. It's a good jump on the bottom. Guest going to get a big shove by Garrett Lowe. They're hooked up to turn one, but there's a big gap behind the 34. Does that two-car breakaway hurt or help the inside off of two? I think, it, well, it's going to hurt Garrett Lowe as Guest goes up to block. There's going to make a move on the high side. Colin Keister's going to have to go back down to the bottom as he and Guest trying to control each of these lanes. Colin Bowden's kind of in the catbird seat. Is he going to push Jimmy Mullis by or try to make his own move to the third lane? If we get to the white flag, it's official, and it is as they're four wide for second. Colin Bowden up to the race lead at a turn one. Bowden's got the speed, four wide behind. Now stack it up and reckon in turn two, but the battle for the race lead is on. Bowden topside, guest inside, no help low as the seven of Malik Ray gonna push Colin Bowden to the lead. What can the seven do though? One funnel look at a turn four. Bowden holds the inside, Ray right to the outside, three wide to the stripe, and it is Malik Ray, topside. Race winner at Atlanta. And he did it in textbook fashion. He backed off to Derek Bordeaux in turn three. And finally, Malik Gray has been in this position so many times. And you could see how much this means to him. Malik Gray, finally, you are a Coke Series winner. Set him up perfect pushed the 17 out to the lead and left him hanging and in career start number 94 malik ray you are a race winner in the enascar coca-cola iRacing series the celebration ongoing malik streaming all of these races has built such a following in the iRacing community i'm sure the twitch chat enjoying it just as much as well and Malik Ray, who has been here and done that, has finally reached the top of the mountain. This winning moment is brought to you by Coca-Cola, the official fan refreshment of eNASCAR. Malik Ray gets his first career eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series win. And again, Malik Ray has been one of the most active drivers on the service on iRacing over the years. I'm pretty sure he's top 10 in terms of overall wins in iRacing history. Finally gets it done at the top level, and he used all that experience he's garnered over so many races to get the job done here on this final lap. And all of these moves that he made were perfectly timed, perfectly made. He pushed Bowden into the lead, was able to miss everything behind him. But you're going to take a look at everything that happened here to turn number three. He latches on to Colin Bowden, gets clear of Michael Gaston second and look what he does here he backs up he lifts he backs up right to Derek Bordeaux builds up a ton of momentum that Colin Bowden was either going to wreck the field or try to win it his own way and he just had too much a perfectly made move right there from Lee Gray picture perfect as he went made the big swing to the outside of the racetrack the car that pushed him off a turn four Derek Bordeaux went to the apron they were three wide at the start finish line and it may not have been as close on the stopwatch as what we saw in the NASCAR Cup Series, but man, was it just as good. Three wide photo finish for the win. And in the end, it is a first career E-NASCAR win for Malik Ray. Blake, you're with him. Malik, the wait is finally over after 90. 
four career starts. You are finally an eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series winner. We saw the elation as you crossed the checkered flag. Does it even feel real to you right now? Yeah, nah, man. <laughs> I've been trying to get one of these for like six years, bro. I just finally, I just finally put it together, and um, and I gotta thank Derek Purdue because if it wasn't for him, um, I wouldn't have even had a shot. So I appreciate him a lot. So I just want to say thank you, Derek. Thank you. I appreciate it a lot, man. Well, you're getting the job done. There was someone else in a number seven Spire Motorsports machine that grabbed their first win. I know you often race with Raja Karuth, and now finally at the top level of eNASCAR, you're able to join him in that front and bring a win to Spire Motorsports. How special is that to you? Oh, man, it's really special, man. I've been trying to, i just been trying to put a race together, and I was finally able to do it with the help of my teammates. So I appreciate them a lot. Like, I just can't say thank you enough. So I appreciate it, guys. How does this change the outlook of the rest of your season now that you've had a great start to the year, you're a winner, and now you get to think playoffs going forward? How does this change the outlook uh, on the rest of your year? Oh, man, it's, it's sensational. <laughs> That's the only word to really, like, you know, like even like put like in the words is it's sensational, man. Um, I finally have a win. Um, I should be in the top 20 in points. So as of right now, I think I'm in the playoffs, but... Either way, I mean, like, I'm going to still be putting in, you know, like, effort, and I'm going to be doing as many little laps and stuff as I can, so. Well, Malik, I know you have a great support system around you that's been waiting just as long as you have for this moment. We'll go let you celebrate with them. Congratulations. Malik Ray, you're a Coke Series winner. <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Um... None more special than your first win, but it has been a long time coming for Malik Ray. Unfortunately, Derek Bordeaux comes out of the other side of that, but nevertheless, a great second place effort. I know going through that last lap, you see everything that's happening in front of you with Malik Ray backing off. Any Anything you could have or would have done differently thinking back on it now? Uh, Not really. I think I, to be honest, that was my best play was to push Malik along Bowden and maybe they would have done something. I mean, the finish was pretty, pretty, pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. But uh, yeah, I mean, if Bowden really didn't, was kind of a sitting duck, so he just stayed there. I think we were like seven miles an hour faster coming out of four. So, I mean, as soon as I saw Malik, I saw and I knew what he was going to do. So I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to push you and hopefully, I mean, I'm pretty sure if they made contact, I'm pretty sure I would have won, but they obviously did not. So I think I played my cards right. Definitely can only do the best uh, option that you think is available to you, but overcoming a spin at Las Vegas, I know uh, moving forward, this is going to build a lot of momentum for you, puts you in a much better uh, position in the points. How does this kind of set you up now to try and carry this momentum through the next couple of races that we have? Well, it's, it's huge. Uh, Daytona was okay-ish. Uh, Vegas, you said, and we spun, and then we tried pretty much a Hail Mary, and it did not pay out at all. So it kind of set us back right there. But uh, this finish uh, is going to just propel us, uh, give me motivation to just go at Richmond and Brands Hatch and just try my hardest and try to get another solid top five, even a win. Who knows? I know I can speak for at least one other Canadian that's in the broadcast booth with me. He always loves to see uh, the drivers from up north finish up front. So Derek Bordeaux, congratulations on your second place run tonight. Yeah, appreciate you all. It's Derek Bordeaux that finishes in second on the Sunoco post-race report. And we believe we have one more driver to catch up with. And indeed, it is Colin Bowden, who has had a couple of opportunities to win in this series. Talladega a year ago comes to mind. And Colin, I know uh, a lot happened there on that last lap as you were making moves and trying to back off uh, and create the momentum at the right time. But you come up oh so close in this one. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a tough break for our RFK um, buildsubmarines.com forward Mustang. There we were a uh, sitting duck. We made a good move coming to the white, and I thought we got out uh, in turn three. I thought Malik pushed us far enough that he wasn't going to be able to get to us, and Derek just pushed him by, and we were just a uh, sitting duck out there. I mean, I could have threw a block there, but that would have been a lot of calamity and. It just wasn't the right thing to do. I mean, it's a good points day, but I mean, that shit sucks so bad, man, finishing third like that when you have that win right in front of you. I didn't mean, I mean crap. I didn't mean that. Sorry, but 
Oh, that's just frustrating that wind's right there in front of you. I'm really good at these plate tracks. I take a lot of pride in being good at these plate tracks, and I put myself in the right spot. I felt like uh, I, I just, just the way the cars uh, crumble there, I don't think there's anything else I really could have done different there. It's just the way it goes. There are any other tracks to know? We have Talladega a little bit later on in the year. We have Richmond Raceway coming up next that you kind of circle and oh, let me really look I, forward to going to. I got Talladega circle. That's my best racetrack. I can't no one get around Talladega better than me. I am. I do want to say that. I mean, I am happy for Malik that he won. That is good. I know how hard he's been trying. Um, so uh, Richmond, Richmond's a good track for us too. We usually run pretty good there. I'm not looking forward to any of those road courses that come to to hell with them. I don't do right turns, but um, all hope is not lost. Hopefully, this game behind us, if this parlay hits, we'll win more money than anybody else tonight. So we're 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 down, but we're not out. So <laughs> all right, well we. Wish you the best of luck, Colin, and again, uh, we hope that luck continues for tonight. Got P3, and who knows, may maybe another couple wins on for you tonight here. Well, big thanks to those drivers for chatting with us. Let's take a look at our Sunoco post-race results tonight. Final margin of victory, 0.023 seconds. Not even the Bowden. That was Bordeaux, who almost made it work. The double clutch to the bottom, just a little bit shy. Bowden, 3 wide in the middle, 0.048 seconds back. And what a finish. A couple of drivers, Malik Ray, Bowden, looking for their first wins. Malik Ray has done it. Michael Guest was in control for the final restart. Couldn't make it happen. He and Colin Keister round out your top five with Parker White, Dylan Duvall, Briar LaPrade, Donovan Strauss, and Nick Ottinger, the top 10. Again, only two drivers that started in the top 10 finished there. Our top three drivers, the best start was 32nd in Derek Bordeaux. So these drivers with these fixed setups here at Atlanta Motor Speedway had all the mobility in the world to try to make some moves. Casey Kerwin was a factor for a good portion of the race, finished up in 16th. Matt Busa led that pack, but unfortunately was not able uh, to get back up towards the front at the end of the race, finishes in 17th. Falkingham Minter and Seth the Merchant round out your top 20. And continued on to pass the halfway point. Again, a lot of speed out of these cars, the likes of Tyler, Gary, Ryan, Luzo were up in a mix early, but just don't get the results that they were hoping for. And again, that last lap accident, too, dropped some of these drivers back here after they crashed in one and two and had to scramble to get back to the start-finish line. Uh, many of them damaged and limping all the way to the end. And it also includes some of the drivers, Blake, who started off well, but the likes of Kwame Scott and Boer just unable to put the whole one together. That's a look top to bottom at your Sunoco full race results. And from a racetrack with its reconfiguration that's still pretty new to us, to another classic on the schedule, Richmond Raceway is coming up in two weeks time, not only for round number four of the year, Blake, but so much more than that, the debut of the heat race format in this series and the final race of this segment number one. Again, a lot on the line for these drivers. We talked about the money and the playoff points, and certainly after tonight's results, it is going to be hot and heavy to see who can emerge with that segment one win and get those five playoff points. But as you mentioned, it, a totally different format here. We're going heat races. We're going to force these drivers to get after it early and often. And Richmond, I think, is a perfect racetrack to showcase that. We're going to see drivers making moves all over this racetrack. Uh, and it'll be exciting to watch, certainly in two weeks' time. And if you had fun with us tonight, you are not going to want to miss that next one in two weeks' time. But until then, that is it for us here tonight from Atlanta. On behalf of our entire team at NASCAR and iRacing, for everybody behind the scenes who makes these broadcasts possible, and of course for your broadcast team tonight. For Alan Cavana, who is with us on Countdown to Green, for Blake McCandless and myself, Evan Pasoko, want to say thanks for tuning in, and congratulations go to Malik Ray, who is a first time winner in the e-nascar coca-cola i-racing series 
We're back in two weeks' time. That one on Tuesday, March the 26th at iRacing's virtual Richmond Raceway. That race and every race of the 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series can be found exclusively here on the iRacing Esports Network and streaming live at eNASCAR.com. Till next time, good night from Hotlanta, where Malik Ray is finally an eNASCAR winner.